The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. This is one of the presentation I'm giving at OSCON, actually. Uh, and the reason I wrote this presentation was because, well, as a trainer, there's just too many cases where I had to kind of explain what was happening in the system. And the Postgres docs, as good as they are, really don't cover it in enough detail. Uh, it doesn't have any of the diagrams. Uh, and there's some sort of finesse here. So people coming from other databases seem to have no trouble understanding what Postgres was doing. But people coming from other databases were kind of like, or that didn't have database background were like, uh, exactly what is it doing? And there was like a couple demos I used to do as a trainer, but you know, they really didn't, they were really kind of half done. So I figured, all right, I really need to write something conclusive that actually shows people what is happening in a very clear way because it is kind of behind the scenes and, and invisible. And I think I wrote it, what? Well, this has been updated in January, but I think I wrote it last year. Um, the presentation actually is available at this website uh, as well as 30 other presentations uh, related to Postgres and three on home automation. So um, basically what we're going to be talking about uh, is some of the internals of Postgres, again, you don't really have to understand this, but it does help you. I know some people were asking about how do you understand explain. Unfortunately, they've left for today, but again, you get the idea. Um, the idea is that uh, this, present, this, this is going to help you understand what explain is showing to you. And it kind of also helps you to understand what Postgres is doing behind the scenes for you that might not be obvious and also there are some things that you can do to kind of help the Postgres optimizer. Um, and, and those will be clear to you once we go through the presentation. So um, just to give you a sort of a large, you know, 10,000 foot view here, we basically have the Postgres server over here in, red, in, in, in blue. And then we've got um, effectively the queries coming from an application, which is communicating with libdq and then it's sending the query to the database and then sending the results back. Now, inside that blue box, we basically have a whole bunch of stages that Postgres goes through. I did put out a blog entry, I believe on Friday, uh, explaining those stages and seeing how you can actually time them. How many of you, any of you see it? So, great, good, somebody look, good. So um, effectively what the blog showed was that you can actually see the different stages and time how long each stage is taking. So the first stage is the parser, then the second, the stage um, underneath the traffic cup is the rewriter. And then the next two stages are basically the planner. And then at the bottom is the executor. And of course, um, what we're really going to be talking about is, that, is that, that optimizer planner part, which is right here in the middle. Again, optimizer planner, kind of interchangeable words. Uh, the reason it's called a planner, frankly, is because the planner actually outputs a plan. <laughs> really very creative. Um, so the planner outputs a plan, and the plan is what the executor does. So but down here, it's basically saying execute plan. When the executor is running, it's really just following the plan that the optimizer provided. Okay, and we're going to basically, in this presentation, we're going to highlight what is it that, how does that optimizer get that plan? Why is that plan important to us? And, and why... Um, what, what is the optimizer really doing to make our job easier by creating this plan? It would, which would about be kind of what I want to say. So how, what is that optimizer doing for our query that's giving us a benefit? And, and the benefit's really pretty big. Yo, hey, Chris. So um, this is actually a blow up of just that section. Again, uh, we're going to be highlighting that uh, optimizer area, um, which I think is, which I really think of as the brains of the system. So this is really where um, sort of the smarts of the system comes. Uh, when I started getting involved with Postgres, one of the reasons that I got involved was an interest in really understanding that optimizer and understanding what happens inside the system. Um, I, before I started with Postgres, I used to work with Ingress and I worked with uh, Informix and I could basically 
ask the optimizer to see the plan that it was generating. And same with ingress. And you could get like a little tree, and it would show you how it was executing the query. Um, but what's always fascinated me was how does it find that query? Like, how does it actually figure out the best optimization? So it, it would tell me what the plan is, but it wouldn't tell me how it found it, right? And, and my curiosity as a programmer was like, OK, I know it's, I'm sending these queries. It's giving me results back. But how does it know what that great plan is? And, and, and if you study it, you can actually kind of see different style. If you rearrange the query a little bit, you get a little different plan coming out. If you change some of the constants, you get a little different plan coming out. Is that familiar with people? Have you ever tried this kind of thing? Um, and, 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 and with the older databases, this was actually an issue that you really had to, to work with because the, you know, the, 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 uh, their optimizer would often go out to lunch you know, and just really not do a good job. And, and you had to kind of say, oh my goodness, this report used to take you know, 10, 10 seconds or 10 minutes, and now it's taking two hours. What happened? And you find out that, the, that something happened in the optimizer that caused it to kind of just go way berserk. And then you'd have to kind of you know, rein it in somehow. Postgres doesn't have that much of a problem in terms of an optimizer going wacky. Uh, but again, it is always useful to kind of understand it. And also, again, as I said, to help, um, to help give the optimizer as much information as it can to make the best plans. Um, and once you kind of understand the background, I think it, it starts to make sense. So let's, uh, let's actually look at, at, at what actually goes on. Um, the question here at the top, what decisions does the optimizer have to make? Uh, and there are fundamentally three decisions that Postgres optimizer makes. Um, one is the scan method, and I'm going to be talking about that. Uh, second is a join method, I'm going to be talking about that. And then finally, join order, which, which I'll, I'll, I'll cover very briefly. Um, but these are the sort of the three fundamental things. And, and in fact, uh, when I started with Postgres, this is one of the, I'd say, one of the early areas we actually did some serious work in. I remember talking to Tom Lane on the phone when we were trying to, Tom actually got involved with Postgres really being interested in the optimizer. And we did a couple phone calls back and forth trying to figure out, well, what is it doing? Why is it taking so long? You know, when does it make these crazy decisions? And again, this was in the, in the mid-90s, uh, late 90s. But uh, uh, it is really a fascinating area. So uh, which scan methods are possible for Postgres? We actually have three. Um, we actually will have a fourth in Postgres 9.2. Uh, which will be called index-only scans, which, which obviously doesn't appear here yet. Um, the first one's pretty simple, uh, sequential scan. Uh, the other two you might not have seen before. Index scan you might be aware of, B-tree kind of index. Uh, and again, I'm going to show you specific examples of that, about this. Well, let's first set up um, a little test case here. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to pull some data from the PG class table, which happens to be a system table in Postgres. Again, just has a whole bunch of junk in it. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're just going to pull the first letter off of that table. So um, again, I'm just creating some dummy data here. Um, I'm going to pull the first letter off of the PG class table. And then I'm going to create a temporary table that's made up of, of that first letter and then a whole bunch of junk. Um, in fact, I call it junk literally in the, in the field. Um, I hope Berkus would approve of that label there. Um, it's not junks, so I guess I, I got that part right. And there's, there's no, what it says? Yeah, it's not a reserve word. There's no camel case in there, so I think we're OK. Uh, then I actually order them randomly, which is actually important for Postgres, because Postgres understands when something is uh, clustered. Uh, and in some way, you want to make sure they, they don't get clustered. So you kind of throw some randomness in there. And then we're just basically in the Lotus table called sample, and we're going to cradle an index on there. And if, if you're curious, you can actually look at the SQL that I used for this whole presentation. So if you download. That SQL, that is literally the SQL that, that goes with this presentation. OK. Um, so the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function called letter, look, look up letter, uh, which actually does an explain inside of a function. I know it's kind of awkward, but again, you'll see it later. It kind of makes the output look nice and pretty. Uh, so uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to actually use a uh, set returning function or a common table expression. Not a, no, this is, this, is, this is not a set returning function. This is a common table expression. Uh, where we're basically going to create a little uh, query that counts everything up. And then we're going to basically do some statistical analysis on it. And what it's going to show us is the distribution of letters uh, within this sample table that we've created. 
So as you can see, 78% of the letters, um, the, the letters in that table are P. Uh, it, it, it drops very quickly to 3%, and then goes all the way down to 0.4%. And again, this might seem kind of arbitrary to you, uh, but in fact, um, there isn't a whole lot of difference between 78% and 40%. Uh, it's really down here where you start to see a lot of variability. Um, so again, you, there's no real definition of this order except that I've basically ordered them. And as you can see, these are effectively unique here uh, in the table, whereas these, these obviously are not. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, let's just do a real crude example here. Uh, again, I think you talked about the explain command this morning and, and what it does. So let's actually take a look at that. Um, what we're actually going to do is we're going to issue explain on a very simple query uh, for this uh, actual sample table. And we're just going to look up the letter P. So we're just going to basically say, you know, if I'm going to look up the letter P, what are you going to do? That's what the explain command does, right? It says, it says okay, what is, the what is the optimizer, what is the planner going to output for that particular query? And in this case, a letter P is outputting something called an index scan. Um, that's actually a little surprising, and I'm going to explain a in a minute why, but let's just go with that right now, okay? So we put the letter P in. It says it wants to do an index scan. It tells us how expensive it is. Uh, it, it says it expects one row, which also seems kind of kooky to me. Um, but but let's, just, let's just go with it and, and see what happens, okay? So then I'm also going to ask for the letter D, which you might remember was, uh, was down here, 1.6% uh, of the table. Uh, and it also does an index scan, which, again, is okay, I guess. Uh, also, also expects one row. Not really great. And then also, I'm um, going to try the letter K, uh, which you might remember was, was a unique letter in our, in our test. Um, and that's also doing index scan. It, it, right now, basically, the optimizer is not impressing me. Um, it doesn't really know how many rows are coming out. It thinks it's always one. It's always doing an index scan. Is this really, really great? No, it, it actually is terrible. Um, and I'm going I'm to explain why right here. Okay, um, the reason the, the optimizer is doing this sort of very consistent but wrong uh, thing is because we've not given it any analyzed statistics on this particular table. So the, system, the optimizer has no idea if there's, it doesn't know there's 78% of the rows are P, okay? Uh, it assumes that every lookup is unique because in fact you can see that right here for one. Okay. So it doesn't really know until we run Analyze or until the auto vacuum system runs and sees that there's some data in the table and sees that there's no statistics or sees that that, that statistical data is old and then run as an auto analyze on that. If you've ever heard of auto analyze, um, that's kind of another feature. So the bottom line is that we don't really have any statistics until we run this analyze command or until auto vacuum is actually run to give us some statistics uh, on that table. Are there any questions so far? Okay. So um, once we run the analyze, you can see we actually get some significantly different output. So when we now look up the letter P, we're now seeing something called a sequential scan. Okay. And this is actually what we want it to do because the letter P is very common. And an index lookup that's not very restrictive, like the letter P, is effectively better done using a sequential scan than bouncing around an index and then getting to the data. It's just easier to just read the data, right? Because the index, we know by definition, the index is only going to remove 22% of the rows, OK? And the odds that, we're, that those 22% of the rows aren't also going to be on pages that also have data is pretty slim. So odds are it's going to have to read the whole, page, the whole table anyway, right? So an index being sort of randomly bounced around and, you know, a lot of random I.O. is just really expensive to do. Sequential scans are much quicker. I mean, you know, by def I think, I think if you actually do some timing, you know, a sequential scan is often like 100 times faster, okay? Um, I know we have a random page cost of four, but if you actually run the the actual tests, random is just way slower. Um, and, and you can see that when you run benchmarks on the drives, you know, raw, raw numbers. Well, it, 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 okay, so the question is how does that vary among different types of drives? It, it, it varies quite a bit. So, for example, if we're running on an SSD, instead of um, a number of four, 
uh, for random page costs, we, may, we might want to take it to like 1.2 or something like that. We still wouldn't take it all the way to 1. But, but even if, I mean, this is a great point. Even if the, the random cost was just, as, was just the same cost as a sequential, we still would want to do the sequential because there's no sense in reading the whole index and then the whole table when we can just read the whole table and obviously do much less I.O. than we would need to, to touch that index. And that's really one of the fundamental things that that optimizer is doing. All right. Um, and what you can also see, the optimizer now has a very good estimate the number of rows. So it's saying 199. I think um, that it actually matches it right on the dot. OK? So instead of sort of throwing out one row, which is what it did here, it now kind of knows, yeah, I'm going after 199 rows. Right? And it's even telling us what it's using as a filter. All right? Uh, and this is effectively what a sequential scan is. It's just read from the front to the back, right? Just, and and the, the, the file system kernel does read ahead for us, so it knows we're going sequentially, and it's, it's prefetching all that stuff from the drive, and, and, and you know, we're humming at this point, all right? Uh, what about the letter D? Now, letter D was a little less likely. In fact, I, I know right now it's four, because the optimizer seems to know exactly how many letters there are. OK, so we know there's actually four Ds in there. And for four, it's not going to do a sequential scan, because again, it's pretty rare, but it's going to do something called a bitmap heap scan, which looks like this. Now, this is a little kind of a, an unusual diagram. It's actually showing two indexes being combined. But effectively, what it's going to do is it's going to create a bitmap. So it's going to bounce around the index. It's going to find all four of those entries, and it's going to create a bitmap of, of, of the pages, and it's going to put one for every page that has a possible match, and it's going to read that bitmap and then go to the heap. And what that's going to do, it's going to aggregate some of the things. So we're not going to go to page 12, and then page 10, and then page 12, and then page 10, and then page 12, and then page 10. We're effectively going to go to page 10, do everything, go to page 12, do everything. Okay, so when you start to see indexes that actually match multiple, um, multiple indexed values, you do start to see this bitmap index scan uh, you know, become, become popular. Uh, the letter K, which you may remember has one matching row, um, does a, a very traditional bitmap uh, index scan. So it's basically going to go through the index, it's going to look for the match, and it's going to be told exactly where that uh, particular row is on a particular page, and it's going to pull the row out. So this is obviously one thing the optimizer is doing for us. It knows, based on the constant that we pass to it, how to most efficiently access that data. But it will only do that assuming it has the analyzed statistics to enable that. Good? OK. So um, let's look at a little more uh, sort of a varied uh, example here. Um, basically, what I'm going to do, and this is where we start to use that little function I created. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use a common table expression. Is everyone good with common table expressions? Is that kind of? So we basically, I have a talk about common table expressions if we're interested. But um, effectively, what we do is we, we sort of create a pseudo table up here called letter. OK? And here's, this is a classic. I've got the name of the table and a column exactly the same. So Berkus might be upset. But um, yeah, I, I actually, this is, this is a, do I get a win here, Jonathan? Um, yeah, so, um, <laughs> so effectively, uh, that may be something to add to the presentation. We can uh, let's look at that. Um, so effectively, we got this letter, and now we're going to basically run through all the letters and their counts, and we're going to basically do an explain on each one. Okay. Now, what does that look like? It actually looks like something like this. However, this is kind of verbose, and I don't want to see this line. So we're going to basically do a, uh, a limit one here. Uh, to kind of trim off what's coming out of the function. Uh, and we're going to get this. And, and to me, this is, the, you know, this is the Rosetta Stone. This is the money shot for this presentation. Because what it's showing, yes, I did look that up. And it actually is not always the way we might assume it is. So I, I, did, I did a little Google on that. So supposedly money shot is, is, is OK. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you, if, What's this? I'm not buying that. You're not buying that at all. All right, maybe I need to pull that out then. But uh, you think I do? Okay. It's it's too too tainted to really use. All right. Well, that's a shame because 
I really think this is a good shot, a good, well, we'll call this the Rosetta Stone then, but I need some other terminology. I'm open to suggestions. Um, so effectively what we have here is a, a display of how the optimizer chooses different plans based on the frequency of the constant supplied. And you just don't see this a lot. You might see a query. What's this? Well, if you had been watching the presentation, um, you would have seen that I created a function at the beginning that doesn't explain. And then I basically go and create a little pseudo table, a common table expression, and then I run the function on it, and then I trim off the bottom part, and I just get the top part. Right? So the cool thing about this is that it's like all here. Sometimes you, if you're running a test and you like, you'll run a query and you'll go retype it or you'll edit it and you'll change a constant, you see the plan change, you're like, okay, the plan changed because I used a different constant. This is the cool thing because it gets it all on one slide, right? So what you can see, you can see a couple interesting things here. So the first thing is that obviously in red we have all the sequential scans, right? And you can see up until you get to seven, you were going to do a sequential scan, which is fairly low because remember there's 200 and some rows in here, right? But still, um, the, the cutoff for doing a, sequential, a non-sequential scan is much lower than people think, right? Because I think we decided this table had, and I'm going to back up here. Uh, where is it? Where are you? Oh. Uh, hmm. I guess I trimmed off. Did I trim off my counts on this? I might have. Ooh, that's nasty. Oh, 253, there we go. So we have 253 rows. The, the R, which I think is where we cut off, is 2.8%, okay? So one really interesting thing here, remember I got this junk field in there, so it's kind of fleshing out the row. It's not just the number, okay? But what's really interesting is that you're, you're only looking at 2.8% of the rows and the system still wants to do a sequential scan. That's really low, but, if you, and I'm going to show you this later, once you, if you actually try forcing it to do an index scan, it will be slower. Um, so the number is usually, the numbers we usually see are in the 5% range. So a, an in, a constant that's passed really has to be under 5% before we're going to consider a non-sequential scan. Yes? Um, no, I mean, historically, we see it in the 5% range. Uh, so internally, in Illustrator, it's 4% the case It's more percentage based, yeah. It's really going to be percentage based because, again, um, the num I mean, and, and, and the heuristics are really complicated, but, but this is not a super tiny table because each one has like 200, each row is like 250 bytes or 260 bytes or something like that. So you're getting, I guess you're getting about eight rows. Uh, no, you get 32 rows on a page, something like that. Um, was eight times four, so yeah, like 32 rows on a page. So um, yeah, it's you know, it's it's not, it's pretty small, but effectively, when, when Postgres is going to do its computation, it's really going to be based on right how how um, what the percentage is, and it is going to be around five percent, I think. Right. Well, I'm sorry? Some of those yeah, the weight values are really going to, yeah. So in, in fact, I have an example here, um, which I think is, is kind of useful. So I, I basically have the, the Rosetta Stone, right, which, which kind of shows everything. And what I actually did was I actually turned off sequential scan and bitmap scan, and I ran it again, OK? So just as you would have done when you were testing, you're basically forcing the system to do an index scan, all right? And now I'm running the same query, okay? And what you basically see 
is that the, the total cost for this P, which used to be 13, okay, has now gone up to 39, at least in the costing system. So it considers this index lookup to find all the P's to be about three times as expensive as the sequential scan, which about seems what we think it was. And then if we actually start to look farther down, you can see these numbers have grown all the way up. So it goes from 8 to 12 to 15 to 19 all the way up as the table gets bigger or as the, it gets less restrictive, you get more, it gets more and more expensive. Yeah, what's really interesting here is that the numbers seem stay fairly low. Yeah, this is what I was going to point out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, right here, right here. Yeah, and right here, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 what's really, I mean, what's really bizarre is when I wrote this, when I wrote this presentation as when I wrote the MBCC presentation, I basically just wrote the queries. Okay, so there's a whole, actually I've got probably three or four presentations now where I basically write the SQL and then I drag it into, licks the, the editor and then I mark it up right so as I showed you that query that I had at the beginning you could rerun this you'll get the exact same numbers okay but what's also interesting is I didn't jury this at all like I said all right where am I gonna get some fake data that has a distribution that I'm gonna that's gonna be interesting right has some variability in terms of common values non common values well system tables boom PG class great right it's small enough I can kind of work with it I didn't look around for something like this I mean, you know, how much better could I get than to be able to see all three distributions in pretty nice groupings, you know? But the, problem, the point is, I didn't do anything fancy to do this. I, this was my first attempt, okay? When I said I wanted some variable distributions and pull off the first letter, that's what I got. I didn't have to do anything fancy to get this, uh, which, which surprised me because I thought that it would take a lot more work to get something that really illustrated so clearly. Right, um, but you're right. These numbers just keep shooting up, um, and obviously it's because we haven't given the optimizer any kind of uh, any kind of you know chance to improve things. And you can see these basically are very gradual in terms of how they increase. They do increase, but again, in a very in a very marginal way. Um, this is basically uh, the original query, which again shows you the, the 13 all the way down to the 8, basically. And so the, the, the 39 with, with the optimizer working fully is now one third the time, basically. Um, any questions before we move off? That's the scan type. Now we're going to look at joins, and this is where we kind of just have some diagrams. Uh, Postgres has four different join types. Nested loop, it has sort of two. Uh, and then hash join and merge join. I'm going to show you some examples of each of these. Again, using some tables from the system tables. And I actually pulled my data here from the PG PROC table. Again, another system table, a little bigger. And I basically just pulled some numbers off the PG PROC table. And I pulled some numbers off the PG class table. So I basically grabbed the OID from the PG class table and the OID from the PROC table and kind of loaded them in to temporary tables, OK? And again, I'm not using letters now, I'm using numbers. These are now unique numbers, so it, it makes it a little, a little cleaner to do a join and a little more predictable, I think. Okay. And one highlight you should see is that um, this sample one is our big table, based on PG PROC, which is larger, and um, the sample two is only 260 rows. So it's gotten, obviously, smaller. Okay. 
Um, and we are going to randomly get those in there so that we, we're sure that um, there's no, uh, so the optimizer doesn't do anything fancy. Okay. And we also have no indexes and no optimizer statistics on these. Right? So this is very crude. Uh, if we just join the two tables together using an ANSI join, and we actually restrict it to a certain constant, we get something called a nested loop. And the nested loop is actually really good for sort of really small result sets, very short joins. There's no setup for it. Um, it can basically sequential scan uh, the one table and then basically just pull off things from the other table. The reason this is quick is because we are only really pulling one value off of, or it's assuming one value because, oh no, actually it isn't. Look, it's, these are the estimates of how much it thinks. It's getting 50 it thinks from this one and it thinks it's getting six. Again, there's no optimizer statistics, so it doesn't know, okay? Um, nested loop actually looks like this. It's basically every row is touching every other row. Again, completely bizarre, uh, but it's basically comparing every row to every other row. Um, and this is what the pseudocode looks like, They're very, very trivial. Um, if I do a different type of join, and now instead of saying equal 33, I say greater than 33. So now I'm, I'm pulling a much larger section of, of sample one. From my, from my query, I actually see something called a hash join. Um, and effectively, a hash join is where you take one side and you hash it, and then you join the other side. You actually do lookups from the one table into the other table. And, and as you can see here, they've basically used the large table to do the lookups, and they've hashed the smaller table, which is something you'll see all the time. It's, it's going to hash the smaller one because that's an expensive operation, uh, and then just do a sequential scan across the larger one and, and, and then do this restriction, okay? Uh, you can see the restriction right here. Uh, and that's what the pseudocode looks like for that. So this is the hashing part here. Um, if you do a query with no restrictions, so we haven't restricted either table, uh, the system kind of thinks a lot of stuff's going on. It's looking at 9,000 rows, it guesses here. Uh, it's guessing 1,200 up here. It thinks it's returning 61,000. Again, it doesn't know. Okay. Um, and it's basically going to sort the two sides and then do a merge join. This is what it looks like. Effectively, you sort the two sides and then you basically compare in lockstep as you go down. So you say, okay, does this match this? Yes. Does this match this? No. Okay, I can move down. Match, match, no, match, no. And you basically, again, are walking down through the, through the comparison, okay? Really good for big tables, but again, you have the overhead of having to sort the two sides. It's, you know, it's the best we can do. And, <coughs> and this, is, this is not, none of this is Postgres specific. I believe all the enterprise databases have the same join types, as far as I know. No, well. Uh, I was really more talking about Oracle and Informix, Ingress, you know, some traditional enterprise uh, databases. Yeah. So these are these are these are very well understood, you know, concepts of how to join stuff together. Um, that's what the pseudocode looks like. Again, a little more complicated. Um, if you do an app, if you do um, if you if you do the join in different order, so you put sample one second and sample two first. It has no effect on how the system works. So it's, it doesn't, it isn't what we call a rules-based optimizer, which I believe was the original Oracle optimizer was a rules-based optimizer. Um, it's a cost-based optimizer. So again, it, it, it's gonna, it doesn't really care how you express it. Um, so let's throw some uh, actual smarts in there. Let's actually allow it to have statistics on these things. And we now start to see some radically different output. So here's our same join using, um, with no restrictions. This used to be a merge join, now it's a hash join, okay? Um, and it actually knows really well how many rows it's gonna get, right? 260, 220, 2256. It assumes a one-to-one -one join and assumes a 260 are coming out, okay? So again, great example, add the analyzed statistics, bam, we get uh, our results really quick uh, in, in a much more efficient manner. Um, if we do a write-outer join, 
Uh, this is actually kind of a new Postgres 9.1 feature. In the past, uh, outer joins uh, were not, certain types of joins were not possible when you did an outer join uh, or a full join, for example. Um, in this case, uh, we actually have a way of doing a hash join even with an outer join, which was kind of a radical thing. Um, because as you can imagine, it's kind of hard to do that because you're, you've got a hash and you're not seeing all the rows in the same way. Um, so effectively, uh, as you can see, it's doing a hash join, sequential scan on table two, and then it's basically joining it into the hash of table one. Okay, and I believe it had to do it that way uh, based on the order we did the outers, which I guess makes sense. Yeah, so the question is, anything older that would be significantly slower? Yes. Um, hash join would not be available to an earlier version of Postgres, so it probably would do a merge join, in my guess. Um, nested loop is going to be really expensive here uh, because the, um, it's going to compare every row to every other row, so you just have to multiply 260 by 2256, and you're like, oh, that's getting pretty big, right? It's, you're looking at 500,000 comparisons. Um, it would not, it can't do a, it can't do a, a nested loop with an index scan because we haven't created an index yet. So again, there wouldn't be any way for it to take that as an option. So it would have to be a merge join. Um, and we were pretty excited about this because again, um, you know, as I said earlier, Postgres optimizer when we originally started wasn't that good, right? And because we've been able to attract some really smart people and we've been able to work in a really close way with our users. So when a user reports a problem or a query that isn't running as well as they like, uh, we work with them directly versus the way a company would have to do it going through, you know, levels of support and there's a whole, you know, and then even if you fix it, you have to go through a whole Q&A to do the whole, you know, round circuit. Um, it just, it's just very hard for commercial vendors to improve these really complex cases. Uh, we've actually gotten really good at it, so this has come out of as many other optimized improvements, uh, which we get in every, re every major release has optimized improvements. Um, this actually came out of some work where some people were complaining about the speed of some queries that they felt should be faster, and often they were comparisons with other enterprise databases that could generate them faster, and, and it was pretty clear to us by looking at our plan that oh, we're doing a merge join here, oh, we really shouldn't, couldn't we, you know, and then we, we kind of get on our to-do list, and then we see two or three cases of that, and then we roll up our sleeves and we're like, how are we going to make it happen, you know? Um, I think this is Robert Haas and Tom Lane who, who worked on this one primarily. Uh, but again, it's, you get major stuff in every release, and, and you don't even see it a lot of times because a lot of this stuff is so internal to Postgres that, you know, you don't, it's not worth trying to explain it in the release notes because how many people are really going to understand it, you know? Um, we, under <laughs> we understand that we know you're going to get better, you know, plans, but um, uh, it, it's, it's really not a user visible change, you know? It's just like, wow, Postgres got faster with me, you know? And yeah, I got this, yeah. Well, that's Right, right. So yeah, we do have cases where we will make a change like this. We'll go into beta. We'll walk, you know, we'll go down that road, and they'll be like, okay, you know, beta testers are telling us now this is slower than it was in the previous release, and then we, you know, we can get that. And usually, we're, it's always fixed pretty much by the time. Right, where we had to. Right. Um, and, and because it's not actually doing the same no thing, nobody can take it. Oh, so what do we do? Uh, you manually rewrite the query version of the software. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very expensive. Yeah, and, and again, they, these users have a tendency to keep re reappearing, so they eventually get what they want. So we'll figure out a way. Um, and, and you're right, after a while you do see patterns, so you're basically, um, 
it's kind of like, you know, you've got the holy grail over there, you know, and you're basically like walking in that direction and then somebody kind of hits you on the head. And, oh, I better, I went too far that, you know, and you're, you're basically doing this sort of drunken walk to get there. Um, and we're never going to get there, but we do have people continually hitting us on the head. Um, so if we get too far off one direction, you know, we get a good shot and then we're like, okay. So we're getting much, you know, again, I think, I think we're, I think we're definitely on par with the enterprise optimizers that are out there now, uh, if not better in some cases, and probably not as good in others. Um, again, that wasn't always the case, uh, but you know we're definitely respectable, and we see fewer and fewer complaints from uh, from comparisons to other databases where we're dramatically slower. Um, we're now seeing kind of cases where. We <laughs> Where, where it's not so much a comparison against somebody else because they've kind of given up on that other thing, uh, whatever that was, and it's basically like, you know, this query is really fast, but this other query where you, you know, when I change this little thing becomes slower. So we're now competing against ourselves in some ways. Um, as, as Josh was saying, where we had this thing made real fast, but then there's this thing that made it slow, and probably over time the way we'll fix this is to create a separate node type and restructure what we're doing. And, so for the, sometimes we can't do that when we're in beta as well as we could when we're developing. So we'll kind of, okay, we'll come back to it. And the, the guys who work on our optimizer, uh, um, you know, are really cutting edge in, in terms of what they can do. So, um, and they're really responsive to users. So th it, it would seem like we never get there, but we actually, you know, we actually have gone really far. Yeah, we've actually come really far. Um, and as you can see in this slide, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, you're just stuck there. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, you know, one of the things that I've always been uh, really cautious about as a developer, and having seen other databases do this, um, is databases have a tendency, particularly uh, commercial ones, have a tendency to get into the, you know, fix one thing, break another, fix one thing, break another kind of release cycle. Um, I've also seen them do the this is faster now, this is slower now, this is faster now, this is slower now kind of release cycle. Um, we've always been kind of, par I, well, I personally have always been paranoid about that. Uh, and the good news is that I guess, you know, now, uh, you know, 16 years into it, I guess I shouldn't be worried anymore, but we've managed to really never do that, that I can remember, uh, at least in recent memory, where um, <clears throat> the only case I can remember where we actually took some a little slower was in 8.3, where we increased the number of statistics targets from 10 to 100. Now, 10, uh, 10 analyzed buckets and 10 distinct buckets of, of, of statistics for the optimizer was way too small. Um, but 100 is probably where it needs to be, but there were some very simple queries that looking up those statistics became a little slower than it used to be. And we did hear about it, you know. Uh, we don't hear about it as much now because, again, all of the complex queries tremendously benefited from, from that. But that was, that was one of the few cases where we really had, uh, you know, where we really had to take a hit on some class of queries to make what we considered the majority queries significantly faster. We did leave that at 100. Um, now, users can change those numbers for particular tables if they want to. Um, but that was, again, that was in 8.3, so that was, I guess, four years ago, three years ago. Um, and uh, it, it was one of the few cases where we had to do, we had to do a trade-off. Uh, in almost every other case, we finally, we managed to figure out how to get a win across the board without affecting everyone else. Although, again, Josh had that other case where, where we had a king. So we're, we're actually really cautious about that. I don't think the commercial databases do that at all well. I think primarily because of the lack of communication between and lack of feedback. It's not so much the communication, but the lack of feedback to the developers in what they're doing. That's right. Way before they make it into an official release, um, 
you know, I, the classic, you know, the classic case from my history was Informix uh, 5 that went to Informix 6. Informix 6 was an aborted release. Everyone went back to 5. When they went to 7, it took about two years for Informix to shake out the bugs in that. And at, by that point, I think people had become so, had lost so much trust in what Informix was doing that they really started to look at other options. And I think it hurt the company tremendously. Now, of course, there were other problems with the company. There was an accounting problem and, you know, there were some business problems as well. But engineering-wise, um, and that's just a, obviously an example that I think repeats across the industry, uh, the commercial industry at least, where, where it's just really hard for engineers um, to, to do the type of sort of cutting edge stuff that they like to do. And it's always a risk reward thing. Whereas for us, it's like, mm, there's not a whole lot of risk because we got four or five, six months of beta. This goes go for the reward, you know? Um, and, and we're very nimble at doing stuff. Whereas the commercial companies are very, un, you know, very rigid. Um, and and that, that really works against them. It has some advantages, I'm sure, but, but it really works against them, I think, in, in trying to do good engineering. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a different, it's really an engineer's driven development. Um, and, and I think that's, you know, it's just part of the reason Linux has succeeded and, and a lot of the other stuff. You know, I mean, you know, the classic case to me is, is we've got Postgres, we've got people coming from other databases, you know, on a daily basis and regular basis, leaving, leaving software, even if it's free for them, they're leaving for Postgres because they find they're more effective, they're, Postgres is easier to administer, it's more reliable and, and more robust, it requires less administration, you know. But again, the, co the, the, the software that they're leaving has been developed by, you know, billion dollar companies with hundreds or thousands of people all behind that software. And, you know, what are we that, that, that we're somehow attracting these people, you know. And, and it's really just, I think the, it's sort of the end, it's, it's sort of like, even though these companies are so large, there is such an impedance mismatch between the engineering they're trying to do and the actual result that comes out that even the billion dollars doesn't save them. You know, I mean, a classic case would be, you know, how does Linux, uh, you know, really as a ragtag group, you know, basically take on Solaris, AIX, uh, HPUX, uh, you know, SCL, all these really big players from the 90s and effectively just, you know, they pretty much end up, you know, just shadows of themselves. Uh, you would think it would, that was impossible as well. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's sort of your common sense says that this can't work, but you know, your engineering says, well, it does, so let's just keep doing it. Yeah, eventually, yeah, eventually you get to a new, a new common sense. But even, it's still, it still seems a little surprising, uh, and uh, so. Anyway, that's my, that's my kind of soapbox example of, of, of some of the stuff that's going on here and, and sort of some background in, in how this process works and how you get those kind of new features uh, in Postgres. Um, if, we if we do something called a cross-join, I bet you've never done this before, it's, it's basically uh, join everything, it's a Cartesian product, right? So that's always going to be a nested loop because... Right, yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> Yes. So, um, okay. Okay. So, um, all right. So this is a nest. This is a cross join again. Join everything to everything else. Um, if we add indexes to this, so now we have some additional options because we have an index here. Um, we now, for this particular query, are able to do a nested loop with index scan because again, yes. No. You do not need to analyze. So the question is, do you need to analyze after the index? No. Uh, the, the analyze is done the exact same way whether the index exists or not. Good point. Uh, so basically, um, the nested loop with an index scan, which again was not possible before, um, this is what that index uh, loop, loop looks like. That's the, um, that's the pseudocode for that. Um, if we do a join on the junk field, it actually knows that the junk field has X's in it and not A's. So when I look at all my A's, I'm like, like okay, how, you know, and it just does, it's like, well, I think I'm gonna get one row. I'm gonna give you the benefit of the doubt. I don't think there's anything there, but I'm gonna assume there's one row, and I'm just gonna do a nested loop because that's the fastest thing I can do. 
okay? Um, but it knows there's not much going on here, okay? If I look for actual x's, then I start to see some heavy lifting. It's now going to do a hash join. It's going to hash the one side because it knows we're in for some serious work. Uh, and it knows that these tables are going to return a lot of rows. Okay. No, it's always known about this. Oh, yeah. By the way, when you get into the weeds with stuff, when you, you start to understand why this row or tab is just being stored here, because the legend is easier. <laughs> Under the <laughs> yeah. Like Query hints. Um, so uh, what if we use, um, I'm going to show you one last thing here, and that's the limit clause. Um, this, is the, this is a query that's just joining the whole, the whole set, basically, with no restriction. And you can see that it actually does generate a hash join. But if you add a limit clause to the same query, you notice that it changes from a hash join actually to a nested loop. And the reason it does that is because the limit clause knows that we're only going to be returning a subset of the rows. So if it can get at those rows quicker, if you can get to a su that subset quicker, it will do it. So what it's effectively doing is it's doing an index scan, again, allowing me to pull off the first couple rows from that particular table here. It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, yeah, sample two. So it's, it's basically going to do an index scan of sample two pull off one row, okay, and then return it real quick, right? Um, and effectively, here's, here's how it's going to do it. Um, so, so it's kind of giving you an idea of how the system kind of knows when you do limit. Now, if I'm doing limit one here, even if I do a limit 10, it's still doing a nested loop, okay? Because again, it knows it's not going to run through the whole result set. If we go to a limit 100, now we're starting to get more data here. And uh, we actually start to do a hash join. Okay, so we're like, okay, now we're going to be going through a significant amount of data and we have to start doing that. Okay, so that is actually all I had. Um, again, we had some good questions. I appreciate that. Um, as you can see, the system is pretty complicated, um, but I think this presentation does illustrate kind of what's going on in there and how that optimizer is helping you. Um, so you can just basically throw the query at, the, at, the, at, the, at Postgres, and Postgres is doing a lot of this background stuff that would be virtually impossible for you to do in an application, um, and getting you that data as quickly as it can. Exactly. One of the great advantages to using SQL in the first place is having that optimizer there, um, so that you don't have to do a lot of that planning in your application, which is what I used to have to do before SQL, of course. Well, thank you. Okay. Uh, that is not. Um, so the question is, do we have the ability to freeze statistics so they don't change? Uh, that actually is not, we, we feel that the freezing statistics would act, freezing of statistics in, in most cases would obviously work against the user because, of course, it would change 
it would not allow the system to adapt as the data changed. Um, we have had some requests from a small minority of users who are basically saying, don't change the plan. I don't care what happens. What are the changes that and we, actually have the ability to save data plan? Right. So we, we've kind of, we're, we're actually trying to, yeah. Re right. Unless you use prepared statements. Yeah, but prepared statements only last six seconds. Right. So it would be long term. What I'm saying is that, you know, not on the regular user interface, but like, you know, your client will be speaking on it. They have the tools to do the system, they understand the basic procedures very well. Right. That's the examples right here. That's all we got. <laughs> From, from, uh, from the 10,000 foot view, we understand what users are trying to achieve, right? The, the real thing we haven't figured out or we're still work, we're still trying to triangulate on is exactly how to give that to them in the best way possible. Because we're having a lot of people coming from other systems saying, I need to achieve plan stability, so give me hints. I need to plan, achieve plan stability, so freeze my stats. I need to change plan. So, so the problem is that when we look at these other solutions that people have come to the solutions to a particular problem, which is plan instability, we're not really happy engineering wise with some of these solutions because we feel that there's a lot of downside that can come with it. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business changing applications from small office phone systems to mission critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again. This time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. 
User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astra Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. 
there's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack.